hands up. We have uh, Nikki in the room who's doing our IT facilitation and there's waving at you there. Uh, and there's also myself who should be able to see hands if they go up. Um, if you want to uh, say something but you don't want to speak, put your chat in the put your comment in the chat for any questions. Uh, yeah, I think recording has started. Brilliant. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, so quick overview, we will be doing some presentations and they'll be doing a little bit of breakout rooms and some Mentimeter work, which is where you answer a survey online and it will show on screen. So that's always quite fun. And I think I'm going to start, Nikki, if you're ready, if, with a quick introduction Mentimeter. So the question uh, to start off is, why is walking important to you personally or in your work? And if you can just put, Nikki's put the Mentimeter in the chat there. So if you can go onto that and start filling it in, that'd be brilliant. And I guess whilst you're uh, looking at your screen and, and doing things like that, if you could put your uh, name and where you're from in the chat, that'd be brilliant as well. Fabulous, we've got some answers coming in. I was just starting to panic then that maybe it wasn't working. Uh, so we've got for mental and physical health, uh, because it provides the majority of minutes that people do to be active. Uh, it keeps me fit, connects me with nature and it's relaxing. It's the most basic form of physical activity and the most accessible for people, I assume. Um, it's my way of keeping healthy, both physically and mentally. It's also a key part of my working life, brilliant. It's the easiest and cheapest way for me to connect with nature, and get outside, uh, to improve population health, physical health and mental health and wellbeing. Uh, I value the positive impact on my mental and physical health. It also keeps me, helps me to feel connected to my local, uh, I'm going to make a guess, community. Can we go down on that, Nikki, or can we not? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably not while I'm in this presenter mode. I can have a look. I might just have to come out of this. We can always share these afterwards, can't we? Thank you to the people who have started putting the, the details in the chat as well. It's really helpful. Oh, don't worry about it, Nikki. We'll share it afterwards. Well, thank you very much. That that's a really nice insight to the the kind of people that are in the room and the and the thoughts that you're already having about walking, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of what's what we're going to do today. So first of all, uh, because this is the first of eight online stakeholder events, uh, rather than uh, do a presentation eight times over and maybe get it slightly different each time, I've, I've recorded a little video about what is Walk Derbyshire and what our systems approach is. Uh, then we're going to go into breakout rooms and then feedback to the group. And after that, we'll have a, a five minute break. Uh, then we'll go back into a Mentimeter and then Scott, who's our insight partner, who's also on the call, if you can give us a wave, Scott. There we go. Uh, we'll talk us through the local data for South Derbyshire. And we'll also think about some external data from, from the stuff that Scott's provided as well. Um, and then we'll go through the next steps, uh, which is basically to talk about another uh, future workshoppy type stakeholder event. Um, Lawrence, can I ask you to put your video on mute? Is that okay? I'm sorry, I'm just trying to work this out. It's a new <laughs> laptop, I'm completely lost. Uh, let's see if that's going to do it. No. Nope. I think you've got settings. I don't know if um, if we can do it. Hold on, let's have a look. Uh, 
yeah if you and then you can still take yourself out <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Oh, crap. done. Don't take it personally, Lawrence. It's just an echo. Uh, I'm just so first of all, I'll introduce my uh, video. Uh, just bear with me while I get it on. While I've got the video playing, I can't see chat or hands. So if uh, Nikki or Jade could be helpful to, to shout up if anybody's got anything uh, that they need to say. Wrong one. I'm really sorry, it's not it's not showing the right thing. It did before. Let me get rid of some stuff. I wonder if if Lawrence wasn't on mute, I bet he'd know how to do this. It isn't showing. You're just going to have to see your faces for a second while I just get it up, I'm afraid. It's on. Her. There we go. However, there's no voice. One sec. Testing technology on a Monday morning. <laughs> we are testing it and all I can hear is me, which is really annoying. <laughs> One second. I test I set this out before as well and it worked. I'm so sorry. Hold on. Well, the person that's just joined hasn't seen this malarkey, so that's all good. The vision of Walk Derbyshire is to make everyday walking the norm for all residents of Derbyshire, with a focus on our inactive population and our disadvantaged communities. We want to create a culture of walking with an emphasis around walking with our own communities and from our own doorsteps. We know that walking contributes to the vast majority of physical activity. It's available and accessible to everyone. There's an undaunting entry level, especially for those who are inactive. We know the physical and mental health benefits to walking. And when we talk about walking, we're talking about walking for both travel and for leisure. And we do know that walking is a cheap and clean way to travel. There are a number of elements to how Walk Derbyshire will be delivered. Insight and evaluation. Insight's important to ensure we're driven by our current knowledge and gaps in that knowledge and what walking levels look like across Derbyshire between our different demographics and geographies. Press Red have been commissioned to complete bespoke walking insight packs, which will be shared with you today with the aim to help guide conversations around how, where and who you can influence to walk more. Evaluation is important to capture and share learning on successes and things that could have gone better with a wider audience and to help us to iteratively change our approach to Walk Derbyshire. Leeds Beckett University are our Walk Derbyshire evaluation partners and they'll be embedding themselves into our work. A PhD student will be recruited to start in February 2023 and their initial focus will be on Walk Derbyshire. Communication and engagement. We need to build relationships across all sectors and with the communities that we work with. And we need to recognise the importance of co-production in everything that we do. When it comes to workforce, we need to make sure we're supporting them. Our workforce includes those who directly engage with people about walking to those who could advocate walking as part of their wider work. These could be people who are either paid or in voluntary roles. So what do they need to be able to enable people to walk more and how can we support them? As part of our work, Walk Derbyshire will invest across the county to enable us to evaluate and share learning around how we support our residents to walk more on an everyday basis. Chesterfield, Erewash, Bolsover and North East Derbyshire will have the opportunity to be active neighbourhood pilots. These are our four districts with the highest levels of inactivity and the highest levels of deprivation. And that will provide an opportunity for stakeholders to come together with their communities to agree on the best ways to invest funding on a place-based level to increase levels of walking. 
High Peak, Derbyshire Dales, South Derbyshire and Amber Valley will have the opportunity to be community engagement and co-production pilots. So that's working with the community to develop an understanding of the barriers and opportunities to support residents to walk more. Within our Walk Derbyshire pilots, there are some principles we aim to embed. They include tackling local inequality and working where the greatest need is. We need to ensure that targeted community engagement is embedded in co-creation, delivery and evaluation. We need to collaborate, share and learn across local priority places and share that learning across Derbyshire. We need to ensure that, ensure that we're looking at a systems approach, considering the widest range of influences and interactions. We need to ensure our practice is inclusive and that all our opportunities are available to anyone. We need to make sure we're connecting communities and ensuring people can access appropriate local opportunities. And we want to embed the Walk Derbyshire vision at a local level. Today's session will help support the pilots and moving on from this, each district and borough will look at developing a consortium who will develop their local bid and take the pilot work forward. The pilot work provides us with an opportunity for each district and borough to explore and develop a system approach to walking. I'm now going to hand over to James Cook, who will talk us through the complexities and benefits of a system approach to walking. Walk Derbyshire aims to adopt a systems approach to walking. It's important for us to develop a shared understanding of what system working means to us. A system is a way of thinking about the bigger picture. Systems thinking is less concerned with how an individual department or organisation operates, but more with how the connections, interactions and feedback between them help shape the outcomes we want to see. When considering the wider sectors that play a role in enabling people to move more, it includes partners such as health, community safety, volunteer community sector, business, highways and many, many more. So why is taking a systems approach important for Walk Derbyshire? Physical inactivity, like many other social outcomes, is complex. By this, we mean there are a range of different factors that will impact upon whether a person is or isn't active. If we think about some of those different factors, for example, are there footpaths for people to walk on and what condition are they in? Are there main roads to cross? Are there planning applications around active travel and what do these include? And do people feel safe in their own communities? All of those different factors are interacting with each other in different ways at different times. And of course, when we talk with our communities to understand their lives, what's important to them and what would enable them to walk more, we need to remember that each, each individual and family unit will experience those factors in different ways. As with all complex issues, there isn't a single intervention or solution. There's not one organisation or individual that has the answers. Change requires collective action from across sectors at all layers. We need to work collaboratively with our communities and with different partners and different sectors to understand those factors impacting on whether people choose to walk and what does that mean for our collective action. So how do we know that we are working in complexity? Well, some of what we do will be simple, some of it will be complicated and some of it will be complex. For example, we know that something is simple if by taking an action, we know that it will achieve the desired outcome. For example, if we switch a light switch on, we know that the light will come on. For something that is complicated, we know that if we take several actions, often expert steps, that it will achieve the desired outcome. For example, a mechanic will know that when fixing a car engine, that they need to take several steps, often in the right order, at the right time, to achieve that desired outcome. In terms of complexity, well, we know we are working in complexity when we do not know in advance if something will work. For example, just because something works in one community, it does not mean that it will work in another community or even that it would work in that same community a year down the line. It is important to recognise and understand when we are working in complexity. The good news is that although we do not know in advance if something will work, we can plan for working in complexity. Key to this is setting up processes to enable us to learn quickly about what is working so that we can amplify it. And just as importantly, learn quickly about what doesn't work so that we can stop or adapt. As we've, as we've established around inactivity, we know that we are working in complexity. So we need to feel comfortable that the work is to explore, experiment 
and learn together about how Walk Derbyshire can enable people to walk. The vision of Walk Derbyshire is to make everyday walking the norm for all residents of Derbyshire. Sorry, I think I played that again by mistake, but you get the gist. Um, yeah, following on from that, sorry, I'm just admitting somebody to the lobby. Um, following from that, um, we're going to have a little breakout room around uh, what a systems approach could look like in South Derbyshire. Uh, but first of all, if we could get another Mentimeter on, Nikki, that'd be great, around uh, what system partner that you feel you represent. Sorry, I'll just put the, the links in. back in the chat Thank in you. case anybody's not got it on. Um. Sam, I've just had the same challenge. I've had to refresh my page, uh, my internet page, and it's brought up the new question. If that helps anybody else as well. Brilliant. So we've got oh, Active Derbyshire, uh, Promoter, Oh, it moves. Walk Derbyshire, Grizzydale, PPG, uh, policy. <laughs> this is difficult. Promoter and enabler, uh, the NHS, local authority, public health, walk leader, fresh red. Uh, I think I've gone through everyone. That's really, really helpful. Infrastructure, National Forest Company. Brilliant, Fab, thank you. And I think so. If we could split into breakout rooms now, how many people have we got on this call, Nico? We have got, uh, I think there's 22 of us, so I'm just struggling to get, we're struggling to get Martin in, aren't we? Yes, I can't get Martin in yeah. either. Um, with, yeah, so there's going to be five or six in each room, I think, if that's all right. Yes, yeah, so if we do four yeah. breakout rooms, I think Nikki will allocate you. If we do a 15 minute conversation and then a quick round of um, feedback to the group, which your facilitators will feed back, uh, and then we'll have a, a quick break before I introduce Scott as our insight partner. So I will give a quick um, overview of what our group talked about, and then I'll come to Jade to talk about yours, then Tor, and then I think Scott, were you? Yeah. I can't see him anymore, but oh, it's, it's, there's your head. Um, so my group talked about we we had some uh, people who were already very well linked in with each other actually so we had um Alison from the Trent Valley Way and we had Zoe from the National Forest Helen who is a health and well-being coach and a walk leader um Michelle who is from Ross it's a word I can't say at all probably can say it very well Roslisden Forestry Centre and uh, Ian from the Active Schools Partnership uh Already, most people were fairly well linked up, and I think the general feeling from our group was that where the where people are linked up, they work really well together. But it, the difficulty is finding out who else is out there and what they're doing to be able to link up in that way. We had a quick discussion about some barriers, and I'm not really sure it was particularly as such about barriers to a systems approach to walking, because it, although it does, I guess it it does go into it. But we talked about uh, Barriers being uh, capacity and resource, uh, infrastructure, access, and sort of um, short term contracts for work as well. Um, lots of people in the room were already advocating the importance of uh, walking in all of their work and, and um, connecting with walking and nature. So that was really uh, interesting to hear. That's about as far as we got, I'm afraid. So, um, Jade, if I can hand over to you to give a quick update about your room. Can, or at least I can try. Uh, we had a really great mix um, of individuals. 
Um, and actually, I think most, if not all, of, apart from myself, are residents as well. So it was really interesting to get that dual perspective of somebody's work role and kind of from a resident perspective as well, which I think was really valuable. Um, so we had Kate, um, who works at the district council um, in kind of the countryside team. So links with pathways, footpaths, um, and she shared some of her volunteer roles as well, um, linked as a PPG, like into the PPG at the local surgery. We had Mara, who's a resident and also part of another patient participation group um, and shared some of her experiences. Richard, who's at district council as well, works in the planning team. Um, and Andy, who had a number of different roles um, in terms of his kind of organisation as Peak Running. They're also supporting through Peak Running some of the wider walk Derbyshire work um, around workforce roles. So actually we had a real mix of kind of different perspectives and kind of really saw that that kind of individual, the impact from kind of, of I guess, the practicalities of walking um, and kind of some of those reasons, um, thinking about the system um, and recognising how do we better understand people's roles, their responsibilities and how we best connect to get the most out of people who want to be part of something together. Um, and just that kind of, I think it was phrased as the elephant in the room of walking, that real broad mix of individuals. So I think it was really touching on the breadth and the depth of that network and, and actually how can we make sure all of those different people from um, local landowners came up in terms of kind of blocking off barriers um, having collected planning routes um, that fear of getting lost and that knowledge so some real rich information I won't carry on anymore because I'll be talking for a long time <laughs> that's a flavour thanks Jay that was really good I was going to come to Scott but he's uh, we're struggling to let him back in so uh, Tor do you want to update on your group yep um so we're in an our group was Lawrence Oates from the Conservation Volunteers, Debbie Chesterman, who works for Intelligent Health now, but was um, a key player in the South Derbyshire for 20 years. So she had a lot to say, obviously, about her experience of that. And uh, Stephen, is it Leaf? Sorry, I didn't check your surname uh, pronunciation, Stephen. He's the patient participation group. Um, from Gresley Dale and then also shortly uh, halfway through we had Martin Thomas join us um, so we were looking at um, we only managed to get the first two sort of key points discussed but in terms of working differently uh, Debbie raised the um, point that actually in South Derbyshire we've had some really good partnership work over the the years and the the networking in South Derbyshire has been really good um, so it just really a case of working um, from that basis and trying to improve links, um, trying to encourage other partners to obviously participate, uh, improve public awareness and just making use of things that are already available that we're, we're perhaps not using. So Stephen made a really good point that uh, things like the video screens in the doctor's surgeries, you know, just trying to make sure that any organised walks and um, any information that we have could go on those screens. Uh, it's just a case of finding out who to speak to and how to get those connections in place. Um, Stephen also mentioned that the um, the fact that there are so many additional supportive groups, so people like the South Derbyshire Roadrunners and the walking groups that are connected to those um, and just trying to build people's confidence by highlighting those groups and, and getting them to join them so that they've got a starting uh, place to improve their own abilities, strength, confidence and then be able to walk perhaps more for travel. Um, in terms of barriers, we looked at obviously the, the difficulty in getting wider partners involved um, and uh, one of the key points that Debbie raised was that where, where we've got new developments in the area that trying to start right from the very beginning in terms of getting the footpaths um, and the greenways um, connected with those new developments to existing developments. Um, that's a crucial stage to be able to actually get things done before things get too far and then it's too difficult to put those in. Um, in terms of improving people's confidence, we discussed the fact that, you know, things like improving footpaths, um, street lighting, zebra crossings, making sure that everything is accessible and that people feel comfortable using those spaces uh, would break down some of the barriers um, and improving 
a sense of community safety. Um, and also one of the other barriers was just trying to engage with different social groups um, and trying to make walks that are interesting for everybody um, and trying to tackle those differences. And that's as far as we go, I'm afraid. Thank you, Tor. I feel like your group had more time than everybody else's because you, you got a lot out of there. So oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Scott's back. Uh, or has he gone again? Not sure. Scott, are you Hello. in the room? I, I am back, hopefully. Can you hear me? All right? I, yes. Are you able to I, update very quickly about what your group I, discussed? I can't. I'm just, well, I am now having to tether to my phone. So <laughs> oh. things are possibly a little bit fragile, but hopefully it won't <laughs> affect the presentation too much. Um, in terms of my group, I had uh, Martin, who's a volunteer for the Ramblers, Sam from Public Health, Dave from Sustrans and, and Lee from the local authority. Um, we had a good conversation, you know, uh, you know, there was a lot of comment around the need for this work and the need people recognising it being a systemic issue and, and the need to work together to try and tackle it. There was a quite a bit of commentary around you know to do that we've got to start with the, the environment and the space and what it's like for people to um how that enables people to choose walking up in brackets or cycling over the use of the car um and, and and particularly for those short trips and what we might need to do to be able to do that um especially around how ingrained the car is that was one of the challenges that i think came out of the conversation just about how ingrained getting in the car is in in, in our behavior um and so and and then we had a little bit of a conversation around who's not in the room and and and, I, and the biggest bit that came out of that was politicians we need to get the, uh, the people that can uh, make influence the decision making in the room. There's some clients, about chief executives as well as part of that, particularly from some of the key partners and then highways with the three kind of um, um, areas of people that if, if they're not already in the room, we, we probably need to be thinking about tactically what we, we can do about that. So, OK. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, quite timely. We are going to go into a little five minute break. And I did realise as I went into my breakout room that I hadn't in introduced myself to this group at all. So I do apologise. I am I am Heather Clarkson. I'm the Walk Derbyshire lead. You will have heard my voice in the video, but I didn't say it out loud, so I do apologise. Um, if we can have a five minute break and come back at, at five to eleven, that'd be really helpful. Thank you.
looks like a few people are having internet issues this morning, which is it's Monday, isn't it? Nothing likes working on a Monday. <laughs> Me included. Hello everyone, I think people are coming back slowly. I'll just give another minute or two just to make sure. Um, if you could hear my dog kicking off before, I do apologise. I've now moved her in this room and should, could you not hear it? That's. It sounds like the world's crashing down around me in here, so that's really, it's really positive that you can't hear it. <laughs> um, but I think most people are back in the room now. Very shortly, I'm just going to hand over to Scott Harley, who's from uh, Press Red, who is our Insight partner, who's sharing something on his screen that we don't want to see. <laughs> oh no, I think he might have frozen. Nikki, are you, are you able to take control? Because Scott is definitely frozen. And if we could just put out a, a Mentimeter before we introduce Scott around, what is your expectation for this work? And if you could just take a couple of minutes to have a think about what your expectation is, fill it in, and then hopefully Scott will be able to comment when he's back. Brilliant, so it's coming up. So expectation, a better understanding of how different parties work together. It's brilliant, yeah, because the more that, that we meet and the more we talk about this, the more that we'll have that sort of understanding together. Joint working is very exciting. Yeah, that's a really nice positive comment. Increasing the number of people in South Derbyshire who walk. Yes, wouldn't that be wonderful? And shortly uh, when um, Scott comes on, he'll talk to you about the levels of walking in South Derbyshire as we stand. Uh, I hope that through the work, through the Walk Derbyshire work, we can maximise the opportunity for walking locally, growing our awareness of others and recognising how we can best work together with local people. Yeah, that's really important and lovely. Um, positive collaboration and sharing ideas. Improving my network overall of Derbyshire to see how the college can help. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, to have a better connected system, brilliant. And to get more people walking as part of their everyday activities. Uh, creating an active travel environment, which puts walking as the priority and downgrades car use. Yeah. Uh, using the benefit of my walking experience to help people walk more. Yeah, advocating walking is really important, um, whatever role you're in. Um, finding out the simple links that we might be missing, but would be easy something to link up. I'm going to guess that might say that's really good. I think I think we can't see any more, can we, Nikki? That's yeah, really helpful. Apologies, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I think there is more, but I can't get it on screen. What we can do after after this meeting is we can we can share these uh, Mentimeter results with everyone so that you can see them. Um, uh, this is the point now where I hand over to Scott to talk you through the data. However, he appears to have gone offline and I don't have any data. So Jade, go on in. Well, that was my, I don't know if Scott can hear us. I have some data if it's not been updated, so I can volunteer to share some slides if I if it's helpful. Uh, but Scott may have reconfigured the slide deck. Um, which may not be that helpful, but I don't. I think it, we've just we just lost him again. I think he's probably gone to come back on. Hopefully, I will find the slides just in case. Brilliant. Um, and when he does appear, um, we can offer that. <laughs> Brilliant. Fab. Does anybody know any good songs that we can just have a little sing through while we're trying to to get this sorted? Anything at all? I don't know. I can't sing, but we might have some. Pudding songstresses, songsters. Martin, you've gone off mute. Are you going to I sing for us? I, I'm a rambler. <laughs> I'm a gambler. I'm a long way from home. 
<laughs> well, I'm not going to sing. Heather, I was only going to introduce, it's not a song, but it is something that I I do quite a lot, which is that when we're, we're talking about this as promoting active travel, walking, and maybe then people riding bikes, and but the flip side of that and the bit that always prevents us moving forwards is the dominance of car usage in our communities and the dominance that it has over our thinking and in particular our politicians thinking with behavior change combined with infrastructure but if you want to deliver a sea change in active travel we have to change the thinking the priorities in our communities as to what people choose and what they and it, we always judge it on what keys do you pick up out of the bowl as you walk out of the house are they you know are they the keys for the house because you're going for a walk are they your bike lock keys are they your car keys and unfortunately cars are a wonderful convenient thing that do an amazing job but they've also created this sort of like environment we allow this environment to develop and school streets, low traffic neighbourhoods and mini Hollands are the ways that we're going to get our communities active, but they are political decisions. Because they will not be popular. I've been delivering a low traffic neighbourhood in Leicester, okay, which is a one party state, which is really pro walking and cycling and the kickback we've had from communities from people who are going to be inconvenienced has been considerable. Now they have very strong leadership and they've pushed the um, physical infrastructure through. And now, six months later, those communities do not want to go back. They do not want their streets reopened to cars. They love the fact it's quieter and safer and cleaner and that people are walking and cycling. But boy, and you know, so it's that political tension it, it, yes. it's, it's absolutely central. If we don't crack that, we are not going to make serious progress on this agenda. Thanks, Dave. It might it might make sense for, for you and I to have a conversation outside of this at some point around mm. around that. Very happy. That's helpful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Thank Very you. Very happy. Thank you. Um, Scott is back, which is great, and. Although I can't see him, that doesn't matter. Uh, yes, Scott, would you like to start introducing your data? If you want to send your slides through to uh, me or Nikki, just in case you go again, that would be really helpful. But um, over to Scott really quickly before he goes again. Thanks, a bit. So, sorry, everyone. Everything crashed, uh, so I didn't have much choice to do anything. Do you want me to go straight into this? um heather and and do the get the data bit are we have you done a bit about expectations how, how do you want to do it i'm just conscious of time really yeah we've done a little bit about expectations okay. already um okay which we can put back on the screen for you to have a quick look at if you want um not I, I think. It, it, if you want me to i can it'd be good to just yeah it'd be good if you could do that i would just like to know where, where, where people are coming from there's about nine on there so or if you pop, pop them in the chat, one or the other. Yeah. So can you see that, Scott? Yeah, I can, yeah. Isn't that great? One of, yeah. the, 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 one of the reasons, I don't know whether whether you've said anything, Heather, why we wanted to do this, um, that little exercise was people can often come into conversations like this um, because there's investment thinking about solutions and about trying to fund solutions. And and the, the bit that we just wanted to try and bring out is is that's that's great. And at some point we'll get to them, but there's probably a lot of work that we need to do to to get to what those solutions look like. And 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 the emphasis being I'm going to share some data in a minute, <laughs> which hopefully will bring to life some of the challenges and the way that walking is shifting. Um, walking patterns are shifting in in South Derbyshire, which I think is is really important for us to get our head round. And then and it will also start to help us think about where some of that last conversation went around. Well, what does the infrastructure need to to be like to to start to enable everyone to be um, to, to to walk more? So um, hopefully my slide deck is going to come through. I am fingers crossed back on our proper Wi-Fi. So hopefully. Um, it will work and I will stick around for half an hour to be able to take you through some of this. Um, 
Okay, so what am I going to cover? I'm going to talk a little bit about physical inactivity to begin with, because that's the frame in which this work is being done. I'm then going to get into you know, the way that we've organised the data so that we can understand those that don't walk as much, the people in our communities that, that, that don't walk as much. And I'm going to try and tease that out a little bit. And I'm going to make some connections to what, what the patterns look like in Derbyshire as we go along and how South Derbyshire might be similar or different. I'm then going to show a little bit of information about getting local and how we might be able to help us think about getting local you know if that's part of the picture especially if we're testing and learning what that what that might you know how might that help us um and then i've got a tiny little bit on children and young people but we can only at the moment we can only get that data at a derbyshire level um but there's a couple of interesting patterns in what we're observing both at a derbyshire and a national level that I'd really like to kind of just put into the room, put into people's thinking about, oh, well, what's going on there, and how do we, how do we maybe learn from that to think about how it can, how we can might use what we learn with with other communities. Um, right. So let's kind of frame all of this to begin with. So I, I put it in my uh, Mentimeter at the very beginning that the the majority of people get most of their minutes from walking. To become physically active it's as simple as that you know it makes up it roughly makes up about 50 percent if you imagine a pie chart of all the all the minutes of physical activity that's done in derbyshire and in south derbyshire minutes from walking is about 50 percent that's how significant it is no other activity gets anywhere near it anywhere near it so it's at least double all other kind of activity types compared to cycling cycling provides about six percent just to put cycling into into context that's that's the difference so you know people already touched on it's natural what this this thing that we inhabit this what our soul and brain it's literally designed to move that's its purpose um so and it hasn't really changed genetically since 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 it evolved to be the moving thing that it is so so walking is a fundamental part of our our, our our life you know the, the way that we go about living our life so so being physically active walking contributes a lot what's really interesting in south derby just to explain what you're seeing on the slide the red line at the bottom that's dropped up is six years of data around the proportion of adults that aren't doing 30 minutes of physical activity in a week so that's what we call the inactive group the black line that it kind of overlaps with is the same data for england the top line the green line is south derbyshire's data for the proportion of adults that are achieving 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity that's the chief medical officer's recommendation for all adults um, and you can see the black line is the England and you can see how they're really similar. The first thing that I would point out about these patterns, because I present this data all the time, is they are quite unusual to what's happened nationally and across Derbyshire in the last few years. Because in the last few years, the pandemic has pushed up inactivity and reduced activity levels because of the pandemic. Of course, it has a load of disruption around sports provision and leisure centres closing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, in South Derbyshire, that hasn't really materialised. OK, so that's quite interesting to begin with, that we've already got a slightly different pattern there. And I'll help you understand that to a little bit of degree when I go through this, but we've got around roughly about 27% of the population, so just over one in four, that are doing less than 30 minutes of physical activity in the week. Um, this data, this it all comes from, if, you, if you're not familiar, there is a, 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 a survey done across the whole of a country on a rolling basis called Active Lives. It's funded by Sport England, the Department for Transport, and I always forget their new name, OHID, is it the Office of Health Improvement and Development? That's really, uh, anyway, almost right. Old Public Health England in my in my in my money. Um, those three organisations fund this data collection across the country. We get a sample of 500 adults aged 16 over um, in South in South Derbyshire on a rolling basis. And when we get this information, we've got to try and think about how we're going to analyse it. Well, one of the things that was mentioned right up front by Heather and James in that introduction video was about every, you know, getting people walking every day more frequently. You know, how do we start to look at those that aren't walking at all to those that might be walking a little bit to those that are walking a lot? Well, this is the way that we've come up with it. 
So on your screen, you will hopefully see um, a tower with four different colors. The, the group at the bottom, just to explain that, so about one in three people, 32%, um, are not walking. How have we defined not walking? Well, that group of people are doing no sessions of 10 minutes or more, none in the last 28 days. OK, they might be getting some minutes from walking. They might be doing quite a few minutes from walking because they're doing lots of short trips, but they're not getting over 10 minutes. OK, so we've used that 10 minutes as almost a little bit of a barometer as to identify. Well, if you get over 10 minutes, you're probably out for a reasonable walk. You get some decent health benefit from it, et cetera, et cetera. OK, the group above the walking less regularly are doing up to two sessions per week. OK, so that's between one and seven sessions in 28 days. And we've called them walking less regularly. The group above that, they're doing between two and six sessions per week. So they're getting between two and six um, 10 minute bouts in per week or eight and 27 sessions across the 28 days. And then you've got the walking regularly, 28 sessions per month. And we've gone with that because it, it kind of tallies with once a day. However, we can't say that it is once a day. Some of the people might have done two of these sessions on the same day or four of these sessions on the same day and had a day where they didn't walk. But it's with the data set, it's as close as we can get to walking, you know, every day. So they've done 28 sessions or more. OK, this is both you, whatever your reason for walking, walking for leisure, walking for travel, all walking is in this diagram. OK, we're going to spend a bit of time looking at that not walking group in, in, in a minute or two. But I just want to show you the connection between walking and being active. OK, so what we've gone back to now is um, the red chunks, the big red block at 68 percent is the proportion of people that are inactive that are not walkers. So if you go back to that third of the population that's not doing any walking, well, of that 33 percent of the population that are not walking, 70% of them are physically inactive, okay? And only 25% of them are, are active. What does that mean? Well, 25% of people in, in South Derbyshire get their minutes from something that's not walking. So they might be playing sport, they might be, they might be the cyclist, they might be, you know, doing their fitness. Then look what happens to it inactive if we get people just going into walking up to twice a week. So one to seven times in the month, look at how small the inactive proportion comes. It drops from 70% of the not walkers group to 10% of the group that walk less regularly. So if we get people just doing a few sessions of 10 back, it's very likely that they'll get minutes either from walking or other activities and start to go into either fairly active group or the active group, the green chunk at the top. Then look at how low inactivity is amongst our people, the, the parts of our population that walk fairly regularly and regularly. So <clears throat> you've got, sorry, I, I'll deal with questions at the end if that's okay, rather than kind of picking them up now. So we can see this, 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 we can't directly correlate it perfectly, but there is certainly a bit of an association with walking and becoming active. That we need to keep in our mind which kind of helps us and it falls in line with some of those those assumptions that we made at the earlier around you know it's a great it's a natural movement it, it helps us get our minutes etc etc and it seems to be the pattern that's there okay what's been happening in terms of so we're going back now to that bottom red is the proportion of people that's not walking and the pink and the light green and dark green uh, for those other groups so what's been happening over the six years of data well it was Heading upwards pre-pandemic from baseline of about 35 percent not walkers to 37 and a half and then it jumped again early in the pan in the first because uh, that 1920 year remember it'll have some it'll have about eight months of that year that are in the pandemic the early stage of the pandemic um, and then you've seen it drop down not walking group has dropped down and it's dropped down to its lowest you know lowest recorded level in the latest data and it's one of the reasons why inactivity has been relatively flat in South Derbyshire which is quite quite interesting um what I would also get, just get you to observe though is just go to the top for a minute and look at how the top bit the regular walkers is actually being squeezed so we've got more people in the middle that are doing something but maybe not as much as we'd like them to be doing um 
so not walking every day or at least getting 28 those 28 sessions in across a week so maybe not as habitual for that middle group and that's the bit that's expanded recently in the latest data um let me just kind of build on this now with demographics. So, so we've got this pattern where it's come down in the latest year of data, which is positive, but we have got some really quite different um, experiences for different parts of our community. So what you've got now is you've still got the same four groups from not walking dark red to the dark green regular walkers on, at the top. And then you've got different demographic groups. Let me explain some of those different demographic groups. Limiting illness or disability is the one, for one on the left. So that's people that have reported a, uh, um, having a limited illness, long term condition or disability. Um, minority ethnic group explains itself, but that's everybody that's not white British because we can't break at a South Derbyshire level. We can't break it down into specific ethnic groups. I'll come back to that in a minute. NSSEC 6 to 8, you might be wondering what on earth is that term? It's lower socioeconomic groups. So, we, so the census asks us all. Um, seven questions i think it's based on the level of income your qualifications the kind of job you do how many people you manage etc 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 and it puts us all into socioeconomic groups nssec one to two higher socioeconomic groups that is people that are probably chief executives doctors lawyers professional qualifications accountants they'd all be in nssec one to two nssec three to five are middle management, lower management, and people with technical qualifications, and the self-employed small business owners, NSSEC 4, and then NSSEC 6 to 8 are people that are in routine, semi-routine work, um, or long-term unemployed is NSSEC 8, okay? We know that those in higher um, socioeconomic groups are much more likely to be inactive than people in lower socioeconomic groups, but we need to keep something in mind this data doesn't ask people about getting minutes from work. OK, so if people are doing manual jobs, this survey doesn't capture it. OK, so you need to just keep that in mind for people in lower socioeconomic groups because they're more likely to be in manual work than some of the other socioeconomic classification. And um, all the others are kind of age group and, and are fairly straightforward. And what we see is that those with a limited illness or disability and those from our more diverse communities are much less likely to walk and walk regularly and look at how high that not walking group is. Over half of those populations within South Derbyshire are not doing one session of 10 minutes or more. OK, so this when we start to think about that environment, we need to start thinking about where the people are that are really having a poor experience of that environment. The other bit group that I want to point out here, two, two groups are really interesting for me. One is 16 to 34 year olds. They are usually our most active group, but they don't like walking, <laughs> which is they are more likely to do fitness classes. They're more likely to cycle. They're more likely to play sport, et cetera, et cetera. So they get minutes from elsewhere. They're less likely to walk. I'll and just hold on to that when we go on to another slide. Um, I'd also want to po po uh, point out NSX 6 to 8, so our lower socioeconomic communities. Um, this is a group in Derbyshire at a Derbyshire level where, where not walking is very high. It's a little bit lower in South Derbyshire, which is positive, but look how small the walking regularly is at the top. So, so there's some challenge there, and I'm going to go into that group a little bit more, in a little bit more detail in, in a minute or two. Just to show you the trend. So this is this is a trend line for all six years of data that we've got for each of those groups. That and, and all we've done is we've taken this is the not walking group. So we've taken the pattern of the not walking group over the six years of data. Look at what happened to the NS lower socioeconomic communities, you know, three or four years ago. And actually it's found a way of coming down positive. What's going on there? Can we understand that in some way? Do we do we have any other local intelligence that can help us build on why we're seeing that pattern? Because it's really interesting and this might be something to learn from from it. Look how stable, if not negative, the trend is amongst people with a limited illness or disability. It, it's gone up and it stayed up. Um, and so we've still got a challenge challenge there. Um, look at the 16 to 34 year olds um it's gone up at one point up to 49 50 percent but it's dropped down a little bit in the latest years of data um we we can't we couldn't get the ethnicity data for every year that's why the trend isn't on here because it's such a small uh, a sample at a, at a south derbyshire level so it gives us a little bit of a, a challenge just one thing that i would say on that um 
when we look at the Derbyshire level data where we've got a bigger sample, we know it's um, our black and Asian communities that are, are much more likely to be not walking than our white other communities or white British communities. So we can absolutely start to find where those parts of our community are within the within the local area um, and we and we can be pretty safely assume that in uh, not pe people not walking is probably going to be high so what do what does looking at the community in though you know the the environment in those communities look like to those parts of our community it's something that we could do with building up our intelligence about um just We've got to play, you know, we, we struggle with sample sizes on, on for some smaller groups. I think this is a really interesting one. Um, what's, what stood out here for me is the students, that younger age group again, and, and uh, you know, over half of students within South Derbyshire not de doing a one session of, of 10 minutes, which is really intriguing. But And then the, the other point I'd like to make here is unemployed. That is a pattern that we see in Derbyshire, that those that are not in work, but are in the workforce, but not in work, are not walking much. What do we need to think about there is, is so, and I'm gonna come come back to that a little bit later with some something I've stolen from elsewhere, but you won't be able to tell, tell them where I've stolen it from. Um, let's just have a little look at this from a deprivation perspective. So you'll, you may all be familiar with what's called the indices of multiple deprivation. It puts all communities in, um, against seven factors. It, it gives everyone a kind of uh, a decile. It puts them into 10 different groups. We can't get the data at a South Derbyshire level for each of the 10 uh, groups, but we can kind of put two and a half of the groups together. So you've got quartiles here. We split them into four. On the left is our most deprived areas. OK, on the right is our least deprived areas. Look at the difference that we've got. We've got a 10 percentage point gap in terms of people doing one session of 10 minute walking between our least deprived areas and most deprived areas. That pattern is very much at a Derbyshire level as well. We're seeing that, but it's not the same in every community. So, it, but, it, but this is a, just another way for us to think about where do we need to go? Well, if you look at this, it's pretty clear that we need to be thinking about people with a long-term illness or disability, people in low socioeconomic groups, our diverse communities that are in our more deprived communities. You start to put those factors together and start to look at the environment and the, and the community around them through that lens and we'll start to get some really rich intelligence about how we might need to change things. Just putting a bit of a spotlight onto, onto low socioeconomic communities because it, it, it throws up some interesting things um, so when, we, when we do this. So, so let's just have a little look. So this is, we're now going to be looking at data that's just about that group NSX628, lower socioeconomic communities. Apart from the limiting illness group, look at look at how high it, it, it is there. It's actually come down a little bit overall, which is the really interesting bit. Um, but apart from that group on the left, look at the next two groups, men and 16 to 34 year olds. These are usually, when you look at physical activity data in the main, these two groups very rarely come out, <laughs> okay? But when it comes to walking, well, they're not that into it, <laughs> so. And they get their minutes from elsewhere, which is something that we might need to be thinking about. But actually, when we start to think about how some of these factors overlay, like young, young, younger adult age, ethnicity or limited numbers of disability in low socioeconomic communities, you start putting those things together and we'll start to be able to think about how we can start to shift walking patterns. Um, so there's there's something for us to be thinking about in, in terms of, of in terms of that, um, uh, how these factors overlay. We can't. We can do that by aggregating all of the years of data together, which might be something we want to do a bit further down the line. Doing it year on year, the samples get a bit small and and and, and become a bit challenging for us to get anything from. I'm gonna just. This is one of my favourite slides. And the next couple of slides for me, blew, well, there's a few slides coming up that blew my mind when I started getting my head around them. So so just stick with me because they take a bit of explain, explaining, but they 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 they're worth their weight in gold. Right. What we've done, this is lower socioeconomic communities again. OK, so we're still with that part of our community. Back in 2015, 2016, I'm going to start by that those columns on the left. Um, this part of our community were doing five sessions of walking for leisure, the light blue, as, and five sessions on average of walking for travel, the dark blue. If you're wondering why the dark blue tower is smaller than the light blue tower, because the size of the block represents the length of the session. 
So they were doing shorter active travel se sessions and longer walking for leisure uh, sessions. OK, so that's that's why you've got a difference in the height of the towers. Now look across, look what the pandemic did, the start of the pandemic did, and then look at where we are in the latest data. From a walking for leisure perspective, we've got both the highest number of sessions than we've had for lowest than, than we've had historically. And we've also got the longest average length of those sessions, which is making the walking for leisure tower high. Look at the walking for travel tower. OK, it's the same number of sessions. It's better than baseline, but compared to what it was in 2017, 18, it's dropped quite considerably. OK, so what can we take from this? The people have found the pandemic, <laughs> something in the pandemic has impact on the way that we've gone walking for travel. To show it you in a slightly different way, this is what we do if we look at minutes. OK, so what you've got now on the left is the total. Imagine all of the minutes um, added up from lower socioeconomic people going for a walk, walking for leisure. On average, 200 minutes. You've got to ignore the numbers a little bit because of self-reporting and all of that. Who can exactly remember exa how much they went walking for? But the pattern is the important bit. Look at how it's increased from 2017-18 to now to, to its highest point walking for leisure, making the biggest contribution that it has in six years of data. OK, now look at walking for travel. It's bounced back a little bit in the latest year, but it's still half what it was in 2017, 18. So you've got this situation where people are getting more minutes from walking for leisure and fewer minutes from walking for travel. Why? <laughs> why have we got that pattern? Now, I'm going to come back to that question why in a minute or two, because it's, it's quite important. I made some assumptions and I think the assumptions are wildly wrong and I'll explain why in a second. But keep just keep it in mind that we've got this increase in walking for leisure, decrease in walking for travel pattern. That pattern is a national pattern. It's not a South Derbyshire uniqueness. It's happening at a Derbyshire level as well. So there is something certainly going on in this space. I'm just going to take us local a little bit and then I'm going to come back out to why I might, we might be seeing some of that pattern. OK, so what you've got here, I've come out to inactivity again now. So the darker the patch of red or, you know, the white, the orange, the reds, they're areas that are likely to be experiencing higher levels of inactivity. So higher proportions of people in those areas are doing less than 30 minutes. OK, the darker the blue, the lower inactivity is. OK, so that it's the white, orange and red areas, but it doesn't help us in a way, does it? It's some of those areas are massive. So so we thought we've got to look at this in a slightly different way. So what we've done, um, there is some data in the in the data set where we can look at what's called output area classification. Stick with me. I know I'm a bit of a geek and if you've got any questions about it, I'm happy to, to answer them. I'll, I'll try and give a brief overview of what it is, though. So the so the Office of National Statistics, when they get the new census data, they put us all into about 75 different groups, little groups where we share similar characteristics. So it might be a kind of a, an age range, whether we're likely to have a disability or not, whether we're likely to own a car, what kind of house we're likely to live in, what kind of work we're likely to do, what socioeconomic group we're likely to be in, what ethnicity we're likely to do. So the 75 of these groups that the whole of the population goes into, they build up to 25 groups. And those 25 groups build up to eight super groups. Now we can get the data at a South Derbyshire level reasonably for some of those eight super groups. At a Derbyshire level, we can get it for some of the sub for the, for the middle one for some of the groups. So we can look at the and, and what's great about these 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 groups is that we can then plot them to quite local areas. OK, so let me just show you. So when we look at our going back to our model around frequency of walking and how much walking people do, um, we've got not walking. And you can see this group called it's number eight. It's called the hard pressed living group. And you can get this really rich description of what those that group looks like and all of the subgroups of it. And you can see within that group, 45 percent of that group are not walking and then 37 percent of suburbanites, et cetera, et cetera. Now we can plot this hard pressed living group on a map. So this is Swaddlingcote. OK, this is the, the town of Swaddlingcote and hard pressed living, by the way, are the streets with yellow around them. So what we know now is those streets that have got yellow around them, there are the streets where people that fall into that hard pressed living description are significant. You know, they make up the biggest group there. 
So we can start to plot where we know our not walking groups are living in greater numbers. So if we want to start thinking about the, uh, our environments, well, can we start by thinking about our environments around these yellow, these color, communities that are coloured yellow? Because we know walking isn't as prevalent there. So we can start to think about what that engagement looks like. Now, I'm just going to zoom us back out again, but keep in mind, if you know swaddling coat, keep it in your head, OK? Because this next bit is, I'm stealing something from Greater Manchester. Um, I'm hoping they don't mind, and if they do, they'll, they'll tell Heather off. Um, but it, it, and, and you might be sat there thinking, why is he showing something that's from Greater Manchester? South Derbyshire doesn't look anything like that. I'm conscious of that. But there's something in this next slide that we really, really need to be thinking about. OK, what Greater Manchester shared with, with me, uh, I, I presented with somebody from there recently, and they do this survey where they ask people that walk, well, here are the destinations that they are walk, most likely to walk to. What are the where are the places that they they're, they're likely to walk to? Because when I saw that pattern around walking for leisure increasing and walking for travel decreasing, I immediately jumped to work. That's the shift in working patterns that the pandemic has created. More people working from home, etc., 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 and we've removed those journeys. It's much more complicated than that. This survey was done pre-pandemic, OK, so I, you know, I'm still going to be making some assumptions about habits and what's changed. But just look at some of the things that people walk to and look how low down the list work is. Top of the list, green spaces. Next, taking kids to primary school, places of worship, job centre, health centre, um, secondary school, shops. Then I looked at this list and thought, oh my word. It isn't work, is it? Or work's only a small part of this. Because when you look through that list, how many of those things have gone online? So job centre, do them online. GP, you do it online. Banks, not one in my community anyway. Well, go come close, you can do it online. See what I mean? These things are not coming back into walking for travel minutes. They're just not because they've gone online. They might be for some people because some people, you know, or, you know, older generation much more likely be, to be comfortable going and see want to go and see their gp younger adults they don't care they've lived the whole life online what does it matter if they're now doing their gp surgery online it means they don't have to get to the gp doctors you know so so these minutes for some groups aren't going to come back into people's lives so we've got this double whammy where working patterns have shifted for sure they have we know they have and and but that's probably for not our lower socioeconomic communities probably for our more middle and higher socioeconomic communities. For our lower socioeconomic communities, it's probably some of these places that they used to walk to that they don't walk to now because they're being encouraged to do them online. Some of that might come back, but will it come back to the degree that it was pre-pandemic? I very much doubt it. And so we need to start thinking very differently about where our communities might want to walk to, what that looks like. There is another slide that GM showed, and I didn't put it in today, but we can share it, which shows average walking times for each of these places. Only one of them is above 15 minutes. And that is um, college and university, which is about 18 minutes. They all average around 12 to 15 minutes. So that 20 minute neighborhood concept, it ain't 20 minutes, it's probably 15 minutes. So start to think about something that's more local than 20, because I'd, if you put them that far away, I'd question whether it's going to work. So, so start to think about even more locally, start to think about what it is that people might want to walk to and start, let's start to understand what that looks like in our local communities where walking isn't as, 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 as popular as we'd like it to be. One final thing from me, just very quickly, I've got one slide on um, children and young people. As I mentioned at the beginning, I can only um, do this at a Derbyshire level. The sample isn't big enough yet at a South Derbyshire level. If we get more data in future years, we might be able to play play around with it. But we've also done we've also done quite a bit of work on um, an interesting pattern that I will come to. OK, so this is what you, we, we can't get the same measures or anything like that um, out of the uh, young people data. Um, it, 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 it's done by Sport England. Again, it covers all local authority areas, but because the sample fluctuates locally, we can't always pull it out for a, at a local authority level. But what we've got at a Derbyshire level is you can just see how once a week participation in walking since the pandemic hit has skyrocketed and it's gone up again in the latest data. OK, so you've got this really interesting positive 
increase in the in the proportion of young people that are walking um, at least once a week. OK, what's fascinating about this data is it's driven by two groups that we probably didn't expect it to be driven by. It's driven by girls and children from lower affluence families. And they are the groups that have seen really quite significant changes since the pandemic started in walking at least once a week. That trend with girls is, is driven particularly by teenage girls and it's gone up big time. And there is something going on amongst teenage girls and walking that we really need to learn from because it has changed dramatically in the last couple of years. Now it's that interestingly, when we've gone into the data, it actually just started just before the pandemic. So I don't know what it was that triggered it, but something's triggered it and it's continued rising. And, I, and it's now at its highest point that it's been. We're about to get some new CYP data. So it will be interesting to see if it's continued in the latest year of data. But there's something going on with walking and teenage girls that if we can understand that a bit more, we might be able to think about what that applies to other groups in our communities to try and create change because there's something really positive going on. That's me. I Sorry for whispering at you for half an hour. I, I hope it's provoked. That's, that was the intent of it. This is just a summary of the hopefully most of the key points that I've just made. Um, is there any questions? Doesn't sound like there's any questions so far unless anybody. Ooh, they, oh, Dave's I, I was, point. I've I, only come off mic. I've only come off mic just oh. to say uh, I'm a mathematician by trade and I just want to say that was absolutely fascinating. Really, really interesting. Great insight and uh, I really enjoyed that and I'm hoping you're going to share the slides because I'd yeah. like to pour over those a little bit more. Yeah, and there's, there's a few in there, Dave, that we, I've hidden as well because I couldn't get them into my 30 minutes. <laughs> so, so there's a few more extra bonus um, and there's there's other bits so we, we can do with this. We've only just started digging into it really. So it's there's there's quite a bit of what's great with the Active Life Survey. Cost walking is so big. It gives us a lot of data about walking. Um, which is really positive. Um, I didn't I didn't know that it was 10 minutes there, 10 minutes back. That's even better. That is really, yes. yeah, that is a that is a great way of looking at a 20 minute neighbor if that's the if that's the concept. Brilliant. Yeah, it is slightly confusing, but yeah, because we called it 20 minutes or like 15 minutes, depending on like mm. Paris, I think has gone for 15 minutes. But yes, it's 10 minute journey and then it's a return 10 yeah, minute journey. Um, I did have a question in the in the chat, which which is one I always bring up when I'm which is I'm all, I always have this unease about self reported data, but I know that there are ways of sort of mitigating that. I understand that. I'm just wondering if you wanted what it basically says to me is the situation is far worse on the ground yes. than a lot of this data tells yes. us. There's even yes. more inactivity yes. than we than this data is saying yes. and it's more serious and I always yes. worry that we under report because yes. it's a self reporting mechanism. Yes, that's all of that is true. So the, the two the two bits of um, uh, three bits of information that I've seen where adults have worn GPS and um, accelerometers in, in Health Survey for England 2008 did a small sample of that and the inactivity was much worse <laughs> than, than those that were doing the self-reporting. Um, Ashley Cooper's do, do some, done some great work in Bristol uh, over uh, a longitudinal work in Bristol with a cohort of about 3000 children and young people and, and activity levels in from that, in my understanding, are significantly worse than what we, what we get from the self-report and stuff. It, 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 it is. Um, in some places it'll be better, you know, it won't be always be as straightforward as that, but the general pattern from the evidence that I've seen is it's likely to be, the levels are likely to be worse than what's being reported here. The patterns though still hold, so the inequalities still hold. Can we see the Manchester slide again? Yes. Let me just come back to the gardening. Right, Michelle, um, this is one of my favourite questions. It, it's not excluded, so we can get the data, including gardening minutes. Um, Sport England collected all, and because they collect data for public health, or HOHID as they are now, they um, it, it includes 
gardening information. However, Sport England remove all the minutes from gardening and publish the data set without the um, gardening minutes. They do this because they don't want to fund gardening. OK, it's as blunt and simple as that, uh, which is really annoying because we are now left in a situation where we work with a lot of active partnerships like, like, like Active Derbyshire and they are get a lot of their money from Sport England. So if they then go using data that doesn't tally up with Sport England's what they publish, it all creates confusion. So we exclude gardening. However, we can look at the gardening data. We, we get the data sets from Sport, Sport England and we can. Now, in terms of this data set, the only slides that it really impacts on is where I've used it in activity. Doesn't, the walking data doesn't matter because you, you're walking, not gardening, so it doesn't matter. It's only the slides where I've shown inactivity that's excluding gardening. So it's likely that inactivity wouldn't be quite as high and active levels would be a bit higher than what it, what's reported in this data set. So if you were to go onto the public health finger tip, tips tool, you'd get slightly different data points for active and inactive than what I've shown here, because that includes the gardening minutes. Because we're talking about walking though, it doesn't really matter. Thank you, Scott. And has anybody else got any other questions for Scott? I think, um, Oh, Jade, go on. It's not really a question. I guess it's just an observation. I know that Zoe's popped a few bits in the um, chat around what the National Forest are doing. Um, and I guess just that reflection for me, I'd put in some reporting that we've done locally around young people is obviously this is is data and it's numbers. And as Dave said, it, it kind of, yeah, just the opportunity to digest it, go into it. But we also have local data that hopefully will complement this. I don't know if that's where you were going, Heather, so apologies. Um, and it's just all kind of recognising um, some of that because, yeah, this is part of the picture for me. How do we bring all of that together? It'd be really helpful. But lots of other people have put their hands up now, so I'll, I'll stop. They have. Thank you, Jade. Yes, I was I was going to bring that up shortly, but you've done it for me, so that's good. If anybody does have any local data that they'd like to put in the chat, then then that would be really helpful. I think uh, Mara, you were next. Um, again, I do, I do not have a question, but um, I do have a couple of observations. I wanted to really thank Scott for his analysis and illustrating so well um, the issue about um, walking in South Derbyshire, because there are two of us on this forum that actually uh, are from the PPG from Gresleydale, uh, which is in Church of Gresley on the edges of Swaddling Coat. Yeah, and because yeah. um, um, I got the impression at the start of this forum that it was mostly focused about North Derbyshire. So thank you very much for that. It's made me really conscious that I am active, but I do not walk. I do not mm. walk 10 minutes a day, I'm afraid. And you're absolutely right. I've been doing my online banking for many years now. I do not even have to take the checks to the bank anymore. I used to take the checks. I'm sorry to say, go with my car, park, and then walk up and down the high street, look at the shops, go into the bank. Now I have an app. I take a picture of the check. My check is depo yeah. deposited directly yeah. on my bank account, yeah. Yeah. you know, and during the pandemic, my students, I teach foreign languages uh, here, here. Uh, my students, I thought, that's it. I'm not working anymore. My students all said, are you willing to teach on Skype, on Zoom? And I did. And guess what? The yeah. pandemic is pretty much yeah. over. Yeah. And many of my students are happy to learn that's from so home. Yeah. yeah. And I'm happy yeah. to teach from home. It's so yeah. convenient. Yeah. And some yeah. of them now actually yeah. come to my door instead of me going to theirs. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for that. It's really made me realize, right. you know, right. And the other thing I wanted to say, because I was thinking, why am I not walking? Because when we go walking, my husband and I, it is to walk in the National Forest. It, it is to go to parks, exactly fitting into some of the stati statistics you gave us. And I'm thinking, why am I not walking into Swadinko? Well, I'll tell you why. When I'm visiting a big town, there are shops. Uh, I may change my mind. I'm heading, say, for the post office. And I think, oh, as I'm walking, I may go here, do this, do that, and so on and so forth. When I walk from the edges of Sodico to the town centre, I'm sorry, it's boring. It's house after house and there is a lot of traffic and huge lorries passing uh, past me. You know, they almost, uh, with the movement of air, they almost knock me off my route. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. that, Scott. Yeah. I'm not just the... one individual, but I fit exactly in what you've been uh, illustrating. Just, just, just a couple of things there, Mara, because they're, they're really good points. And I can say it, well, I can say a little bit more about students in 
from my observation, from the work that a little bit of work I've done in Greater Manchester recently, and you've just hit the nail on the head, Matt Mara, that that students were put into, you know, pushed by the pandemic into learning from home. Some institutions have, have tried to bring students back. Some are doing a hybrid. Some are saying stay at home. And so it's not surprising now that we've, you know, in Greater Manchester, we've got this trend, this rising trend of inactivity among students. And they've almost had a triple whammy for those that aren't coming into the into the into the campus anymore because they've lost the cheaper gym offer and leisure offer that the campus would have made. Well, they're not coming and accessing it now because they're not going to campus. They're not in the sports clubs anywhere. We've heard a, a, quite a lot of sports club numbers going down in, in universities and starting to go back up again this year, apparently. Um, and then they're not doing their commuting. They're not getting to and from the uni campus anymore. So, so you've got this triple whammy of minutes with a group of a pop, a population that are usually very, very active. And, and the long term implications of that are really quite significant. And then just come back to your point around, you know, it was brilliant to hear everybody in, in the group that I was in. You know, we went straight to the environment bit. The, the environment is so critical to this conversation. The way that we can make that journey into town for all of those communities that's not alongside the busy road with all of the trucks going past. That is the question. How do we start to reshape our environments, especially when, you know, it's harder in the urban areas because they're already there, aren't they? And so it's that retrofitting action that we need to start to be thinking about. The bit that I would just add to this, whether we like it or not, whether politicians like it or not, this is going to be forced upon us. The way that I don't know if, if you whether you agree or not with the climate science, what the climate science is telling us now is it's happening considerably more rapidly than the worst case scenarios. We are going to have to get out of cars. Now, there is a, this whole thing around electric cars. Well, there is a growing evidence around pollutants from tyres that are really causing very, very poor health. There is a, a brilliant bit of research recently that's now connecting pollutants from car tyres to increasing obesity levels. So, and it's one of the, it's, it, there's evidence showing that it changes the way that cells react. They burn calories le less quickly and therefore it's contributing to the obesity epidemic. This evidence is only going to get stronger. So, so we have a situation where we are going to have to get out of cars, whether we like it or not. The sooner we get politicians and decision makers to realise that at a local level, the, then we're going to have to have the conversation with the community. It, it, and, and the only way of having the conversation with the community is talking through what we know it's like now and what's coming. And, and it's not an easy conversation, but it's what we've got to do. Thanks, Scott. And if I just bring Dave, have you still got your hand up for a comment? Uh, I have, um, unfortunately, <laughs> Scott, you tick my boxes. Um, I'm also the air quality technical lead for Sustrans for the Midlands. I can bore you stupid as to uh, the impact on cognitive development of um, tailpipe emissions, brake wear, etc. Electric cars. We have to re we have to decrease the number of vehicles on the road by 30 percent. At the basic, the point I wanted to make is in the chat. I just think focusing. Having a focus on school streets, it was the number two journey that you indicated in your data. If we can get people walking their kids to and from school, it gets them into the habit of walking. And the best way of doing that is stopping them actually driving into their classrooms next to their child's desk, chucking them out of the car door onto their desk, because that's what's and we all know you go to a primary school at the start or end of the school day and it's utter chaos chaos and the problem is it becomes a vicious circle because more and more people don't like that environment so they drive because they're worried about the safety of their children we can change that it's happening in derbyshire it's more advanced in places like leicester nottingham derby more urban centers but we can do it and it's political will and actually school streets are very popular it also lays the foundation for bigger for further interventions like low traffic neighbourhoods and mini Hollands. So I think that that sort of piece of work is something that could be really interesting to drive forwards. Thanks very much, Dave. And um, I'm sure Scott will be really pleased that he's ticked every every box in your book. If there's any more that you've got, then I'm sure he can he can do them as well. Um, Martin, you want to come in? 
Um, yeah, they echo a lot of that so just been said. I mean, I have an educational background and my fair bit of um, wardening outside the school gate. And I think some parents who actually would have driven their cars into the classroom if they could have done. Um, so, yeah, school streets would be great. Um, I mean, one of the things I would note is that I'm just the everything sort of is is in favour of the car. In Derbyshire Dales District, they have um, we've signed. A, um, there's been a, a climate change declaration, um, but in we get a free car permit which comes through and they are now trumpeting that in December after two o'clock there's free car parking. Now I live in Worksworth, I've got a 15 minute walk down to the town, which I always, always do. And I walk down by, by things and walk back with it. But actually with the permit, it's actually more of an incentive for me to drive my car down um, run it with the air conditioning on, probably take a flask of coffee and sit and, um, and pollute the town centre. Um, my I've questioned um, my district council said, what's the offer for walkers and for cyclists? Of which there's a, a sort of a, re, a resounding silence, but it's just the car culture which just runs uh, everything we have in society. And I am a car driver as well. Can I, can I just pick, pick up on sorry. that? Just a, a couple of things that have been, you know, that Zoe and, and Sam have put in the, in the chat. There are other models out there, you know, that that's the bit that we've got to start bringing into the to our conversations. You know, the work that happened in um, Waltham Forest, you know, the, the um, uh, I think it's Sunderland, you know, the, the um, I can't remember. It's one of the northeast local authorities that have just done a huge held their nerve. They're not not in, it's off of a tangent, but they're, they're not allowing any new takeaways in, 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 in this area. And, and one of the things that was being questioned would that it would force, you know, a, a worse economy. And what, actually what they're seeing is shop vacancies decreasing. <laughs> so it's so it's shifting the economic kind of assumptions that are being ha made by 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 decision makers that the car is the key to a, a healthy economy. And then so, well, that's why we should be offering free car. Well, actually, it's not. If we can think differently about what it's like for people to walk and cycle to these space and the, the experience that they get through that, you know, the technology is there now, isn't it, for shopping, for something to be delivering shopping at home. Iceland already do it, by the way, if you know, I think it's one of the brilliant things that they've cottoned on to. There's lots of things that they don't do that really drive me mad. But but you can go and shop in Iceland now and they'll deliver your food home. OK, you don't have to carry it home. And, you know, so what does that start to look like in a town? What does that how do we start to think really quite differently about how we move produce around a place? But at the same time, giving people the experience of moving around their community because it's safe and it's in, and it's in easy and it's a, and it's a nice thing to do and it brings well-being to their life. This is the space that we need to try and test and learn in. Um, so it's it's a great conversation. Thanks very much, Scott, and, and thanks everyone for your contribution in in that discussion. There, it's it's really helpful and it's really good to help us to focus where we can be thinking about in the future. Um, I'm just going to ask. Nikki, if you can set up uh, the, your final, you'll be pleased to hear, your final Mentimeter of the day, which is about um, where you feel that you fit into this work now that you've heard everything that we've spoken about today. And just while Nick is setting that up, I'll just go through with you uh, what we plan to do next, really, which is so thinking about the data that we've heard today and thinking about some of the other local data that we know is out there that's always put in the chat and, and Jade and, and anything else that you might know as well. Where are the areas that we need to concentrate on if we're thinking about people who want the least and how do we engage and work with those communities as we move forward to make them to to encourage them to walk more? Um, so the next uh, thing that we will be doing in South Derbyshire is a workshop style face to face event, which is on the 12th of January. It will be somewhere in Swaddling Coat. Uh, to be confirmed location. I'm just going to put in the chat a link to the event to book on. And if you can think about people who maybe aren't here today, but you think that should be there, if you can share that link with them as well, that'd be really helpful. So I'll just share that in the in the chat for you to get that link on. And I think Nikki, do you want to get the Mentimeter up? So it's where do you feel you fit into this work? Having heard uh, and been involved in today's session.
brilliant. Um, encourage my PPG to promote opportunities for walking, um, helping to develop and promote outcomes. Yeah, I feel that myself, my unit, my organisation are integral to this piece of work and we're completely committed along this journey with wider partners. Uh, brilliant. I'm excited about where this will take us. Happy to support the conversation as it evolves as needed. This is already helpful. Such trans are active travel behaviour change and infrastructure specialists with a lot of local volunteers who can support this agenda. Uh, to help make sense of other data and insights, support the work and what we need to learn and create change. Hopefully we'll be looking at some of that on our workshop in January. Influencing partners, access to data, partnership work. Martin, I'm not sure. I'm presuming this one's from you, the Rambler's perspective, but I can't see the, the bottom of it, I'm afraid. And that's it because uh, we, we can't work out to show the bottoms. <laughs> go, on, go on, Martin. I was going to say, making, I mean, just, just making sure that the rights of way network is um uh, is well signed, open uh, and accessible. And there are quite a few rights of way in, um, in urban areas. The other thing to mention as well is that um there's a category which you probably mostly know of adopted highways. So alleyways, ginnels or snickets, whatever you call them, is making sure that they are um uh, they're also accessible and and really well maintained. I mean, they become sort of litter um, litter traps, and that's a great deterrent. Um, but making sure that those that they're well signed, um, uh, whether formally or informally, and that helps. I mean, a lot of people won't even know they exist. So it's, it's bringing them to attention. Um, and I think probably the other thing is just to engage with highways. So I do try and talk to highways about safe crossings, um, which um, uh, have some success. That was brilliant. Thank you, Martin. And and everybody who um, has contributed today, it's been really, really helpful. Um, yeah, so the next steps really are to, to be thinking about where we need to concentrate and how we're going to engage our communities because unless we know what our, our residents want, we don't know how we can encourage them to walk more. So that's a really important way of uh, place to start really is what, what do they want? And then making sure that they work with us um, and we take them along the journey with us. Um, I think there's no hands up and I will close with a big, big thank you and uh, further push about the face to face event on the 12th of January. Jade would like to come in. Just wondered, I believe we have a link for feedback if people have got a few minutes just before we all disappear. <laughs> um, as we said earlier, you were the guinea pigs, but I'll hand back to Heather. Yeah, there's a link to feedback <laughs> in the uh, this is what I need to remember for my next one. Introduce myself and close properly with the feedback link. So yes, if people can um, just do any feedback on this form that Nikki's just put in the link, that'd be really helpful and it'll help us to shape how we move forward as well and, and hopefully help me to improve my facilitation skills uh, as we go on. So yeah, that's really helpful. Uh, big thanks again to Scott for your, your data. It was really helpful and, and for um, struggling with your IT issues, but still making it so that, you know, we got some good information out there. So that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, everybody who came. Thank you. Thanks all. I've sent the emails. I've sent the slides. Thank you very much. It's good stuff. Okay.